Thanks for being with us tonight for our artist lecture with Matthew Northridge. I'm Danielle Knapp, the Makash curator here at the JSMA, and I'm with my colleague Cheryl Hardup, um, co-organizers of the presentation of the exhibition Plastic Entanglements here at the JSMA that was organized by the Palmer Museum at Penn State and includes one of Matthew's works from 2002, Horizon. If you have not yet seen the exhibition or seen that work, I hope you'll have the opportunity after his talk to go up and take a look. Um, the work he'll be sharing with us today is more recent work, and that way you can get a, an opportunity to see the earlier work and compare with what you will learn from him about his current practice this evening. Uh, Matthew lives and works in Brooklyn and teaches at the Pratt Institute. He works with collage and mixed media, sculpture, installation, architectural interventions. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from Boston College and MFA from the School of Art Institute in Chicago. Um, has exhibited his work at the New Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. He is a McDowell Colony Fellow and has had a residency at Skahegan School of Painting and Sculpture, is a Paula Krasner Grant recipient and a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow. And we're so pleased that you know, he was recommended so strongly to us as an artist to bring out to speak on the occasion of this exhibition being here by our colleagues in the art department, um, specifically the painting and design, uh, excuse me, painting and drawing, um, the, Brian Gillis, Carla Bankson, Sylvan Leone, um, colleagues who were excited to share his time with students today on studio visits, as I understand. So we're so glad to have you here and we're excited to learn about your work. So thank you and welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, this is a very quick uh, visit for me, but it's been fantastic so far. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Brian Gillis and Sylvan Leone. Uh, I know Sylvan from New York back, uh, back before he moved. Um, and I know Brian. Uh, Brian and I uh, uh, shared some time together at the McDowell Colony back in 2014, and I became fast friends. So um, it was great to reconnect and have a chance to come out here and uh, see what everybody's doing here. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is I'm, I'm currently in the show uh, Plastic Entanglements, um, which I think runs through the end of December. Uh, so that, that was the occasion to set up this visit. Um, so fittingly, I've... Uh, included that as uh, the first image here. Uh, so, there, so this work is installed in the show upstairs. Um, and I, I don't know how long the uh, section is. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good, actually a good size, but it's about eight feet or so. The original installation that I did was in my first solo show in New York uh, in a space called Gorney, Bradman and Lee. And um, it, in this uh, photo, it, we don't even see the whole thing, but it ran about 50, uh, about 50 feet. Uh, so uh, if you haven't seen the show, uh, here's a detail of the piece. Uh, these are uh, collected horizons. Uh, they're all uh, printed matter. Uh, oftentimes with my work, I, uh, I, I kind of set parameters of, of, of what I'm going to collect. In, the, in this case, it was uh, ocean horizons. Uh, and they're all mounted to the back of uh, acrylic uh, hemispheres. Um, and it's done in such a way so that the image carries through the acrylic, almost like a domed paperweight. Uh, this piece is, uh, even though these are individually uh, adhered to the wall, uh, it's an impermanent installation, and it is variable, which uh, we talked about earlier. It doesn't go in any particular order. It's up to whoever installs it. Uh, to um, uh, to decide uh, in what order it would go. Um, so again, this, pe this piece is one of my uh, uh, older, uh, uh, well, this is the, pretty much the oldest piece that I'm showing uh, today, and it goes back to 2002. Um, so uh, this was... Uh, uh, going back to 2003, um, this was the work I was making uh, when I was coming out of grad school. 
So that was a, a 99. And I, and I continue to work on this, and I uh, was fortunate to get curated into a show at the New Museum um, called uh, Out of Sight, uh, Fictional Architectural Spaces. And uh, this show ended up going out to the Henry Art Gallery up in Seattle. So um, this is, again, called New City. It's uh, made up of paper and found material on masonite, and there's over 3,000 pieces. Um, it, uh, it, that platform that it's on actually measures uh, eight feet by eight feet uh, uh, in uh, length and width. Essentially, it's just a, a square. Uh, but the, uh, the actual stacks of these masonite pieces uh, rise up to five inches off the, uh, the surface. Uh, again, none of this is fixed together. These are all uh, separate uh, little compositions. Uh, there's no painting. There's no drawing. Uh, essentially, w uh, what I'm doing here, or what I did here, was uh, to recognize uh, compositions, to crop out compositions uh, in, you know, through all the printed material that came through my life. Um, it's funny because you know, I, occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll talk to students about this, but you know, a lot of a lot of work has very um, kind of humble beginnings, and I and again, I started this piece my my uh, second year in grad school, and uh, it kind of started off with a joke, and it was uh, just uh, this joke about making the smallest possible piece I could, and if you look if you look at some of those really small uh, um, pieces that are perched atop. You know they're pretty much just just about this big, uh, but when I when I started making this, it was it was just kind of like, you know, playing around with that idea, not taking it all that seriously. Uh, I I think they they were actually adhered to the wall. Uh, I started making more of them. They started to occupy my tabletop. Uh, before I knew it, they were in stacks, and then I realized that they could piece together. Uh, you know, this is one of the things, you know, that you learn as an art student and, and, and you never really stop learning as an artist is the fact that um, when you make something uh, and you live with it, you, you have to allow uh, for it to change and to evolve and, uh, you, know, it, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, as, as artists we, you know, we come up with an idea and, and we want it to be exactly uh, the way that we um, visualized it. Uh, and sometimes that works. Uh, but oftentimes you make something and, uh, and you just have faith that somehow there's a reason why you're making it. And you kind of let it inhabit your world for a while and then it will, um, um, it will reveal itself uh, just through time uh, about, what, about the possibilities of what it can do. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this piece was, uh, kind of my first big moment, um, uh, as an artist, uh, having an opportunity to show it at the, at the new museum. Okay, if we just go back to that image, you can see on that far wall there, um, I did this whole, uh, series of collages, uh, just around the same time. And I don't know if you have it out here in the uh, Northwest, but when I was living in Chicago at the time and, and also in New York, um, uh, the container store, do you have the container store? Okay. Well, uh, this first time, you know, it was kind, kind of a young business at the time, and I remember uh, getting their, they, they would have their box guide, and it was just like this printed guide with illustrations of all the boxes with the dimensions. And... Um, you know, I, I, I ended up calling them up on the phone. Uh, I was up at the, a resident up at Skowhegan at the time, and I asked them if they'd send me a box of these catalogs. And uh, I was like, how am I going to get them to do that? And, I, and, you know, it was kind of a lesson for me. I was just telling them I'm an, I'm an artist and that I want to make collage out of it. And they sent it to me. So I didn't have to come up with some weird excuse about wanting to uh, ship a bunch of stuff or uh, <laughs> just send, send me a box of catalogs, and they did. 
So there's a little uh, lesson I had in just trying to be straightforward and honest. Um, so what I did is, since, since all these illustrations were, uh, uh, were all kind of um, done uh, more or less at the same approximate angles, uh, I could uh, cut out these. Um, they're all cut out by hand with an X-Acto knife and, uh, and kind of stack them on top of each other. Uh, in kind of a convincing way. This is completely, f uh, well, it, I shouldn't say it's completely flat because if you were to actually uh, step up to and look at it, you'd notice that it, it, it does reveal itself as low relief because there's just so much material there. Um, anyways, I was working on this about the same time I was working on uh, the previous work and they seem to kind of uh, talk to each other. Now this is... Uh, Kind of an odd piece, and uh, it's the first of its kind that I made. This is early on. This is called Pushman Laser Beam, and this is also from 2002. Um, so what I started off with is a box of 100 uh, push pins. So if you look on the, this is all on the wall. The the base of all these are push pins, and then uh, over over the course of uh, I don't know how long, I just started to collect uh, things that were uh, either spherical or cylindrical, uh, essentially round forms of, of a certain size. I would take things apart, I would find stuff. Um, kind of, you know, I, I consider this piece in a way to almost be like a junk drawer piece. This is, this is something, you know, very kind of humble materials, just kind of odds and ends. Uh, but everything's uh, glued together onto the base of the push pins. And uh, like the, uh, uh, the earlier work, or the work I had previously shown, there's no particular formula for putting this together except to create a tapered cylinder in which the longest form uh, inhabits the, the center of the uh, composition. Uh, this is uh, about, uh, comes off the wall about seven and a half inches, so it's a small piece. So it's kind of crazy to see it at this scale. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, jumping a bit later, this is called Memorial to the Great Western Expo, uh, which is uh, just a complete uh, fictional event that uh, somehow popped into my head. Uh, this is from 2007. It's a found printed material uh, artist tape, um, and it's, it's, it's about 30 inches high. Uh, the longest uh, strand here is 64 inches wide, uh, and this is at each one of these strands is uh, taped into the corner. Uh, so it's anchored to the architecture also with artist tape. Uh, so it's this porous form. Uh, so if you were to uh, stand in front of me and go right into the corner, it's about 32 inches deep. Um, what's interesting about this is when you would walk through the space, you'd actually see, the, see it move a little bit. It became very, it was almost like a, it was kind of a seismic, uh, uh, you know, measuring the seismic activity in the room because uh, it was kind of anchored to uh, both walls. So uh, these are all uh, triangular shapes. Um, they're, they're all, I consider them all to be uh, like pennants, you know, uh, like flags. Uh, so uh, there's all these devices uh, that we use in uh, flag design. Uh, vertical, horizontal stripes, icons, uh, patterns. Uh, so I, you know, this is all collected material, but I would try to mimic the same devices that we use in flags. Um, um, so this piece is uh, called Havenhurst. And the idea for this piece started with a, uh, 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 f an aerial photograph I found in a uh, encyclopedia uh, from, you know, going, I think it was from the 70s, and it was uh, illustrating uh, uh, North Hollywood, uh, which uh, w used to traditionally be called Havenhurst, and every house had a uh, swimming pool in the backyard. And the... Uh, the fantasy for me is what would happen if you were to scrape away everything and all that remains was the, uh, the swimming pools. So, 
This, uh, this is, uh, like the other work, it's completely variable, 368 pieces. And this is all just made of uh, a gray chipboard and, uh, and collected blue paper and uh, glue. Um, it's the detail of it. Um, so I, I kind of started to archive uh, swimming pool designs. You know, you've got the familiar ones like the kidney-shaped pool, the square pool, the round pool. Uh, organic shapes, very geometrical shapes. Um, and I would consider each one of these squares to be kind of a separate lot. Uh, so again, uh, none of these uh, boxes are, uh, are attached. So there's kind of a game-like quality uh, when the work is installed. And I should say, uh, in terms of measurement, um, it's about 56 inches by 80 inches, and the boxes are about one inch high. Okay, this is kind of a smaller, more modest piece. Um, the, the grid um, is something that's, that's been consistently in my work, and this is just a different way to use the grid. Um, this piece is titled, How to Know and Predict the Weather. It's from uh, 2006. Um, and it's made up of uh, found printed material, uh, namely uh, pictures of um, uh, weather patterns. So these are all uh, black and white skies. Uh, and they're all mounted onto strands of raffle tickets. Uh, so if you look, uh, I'm just using clear push pins to hold these strands onto the wall. So like uh, a memorial to the Great Western Expo, this, this piece inhabits the corner and it has this uh, kind of diamond-shaped uh, format to it. Um, okay, so around, the, around this time, I started to make um, these uh, series of works. I, I just refer to them as map pieces. Uh, uh, this piece is called Map of England, and it's from uh, 2007. Um, it's a found map of England, and uh, these vinyl strips. And if you look at those holes, those are just holes that are made with the uh, head of a tack. Just to give you an idea of the scale of this, it's, uh, it's actually only two and three quarters of an inch across. Uh, so it's really, I, I equate it uh, with the, uh, the precise scale of a, uh, a Honeywell thermostat. <laughs> yeah, new, like we don't, there's not so many of those anymore, but you, you remember those. <laughs> like really, really beautiful design, but not, not meant to be noticed. You know, it's small, it, it inhabits a wall, you might even forget it's there. Uh, so that was another idea that came out of this uh, that kind of revealed itself in later work, and that was to make work that's not meant to be seen. Uh, or work that's made to be discovered. So how, however that happens uh, is out of my control, but I would make something that, that didn't really call attention to itself, and, and uh, this piece being one, you know, because of the scale and, uh, and everything, um, would, would do that. And along uh, the same series here, this is Map of Antarctica from 2009. Uh, wood, metal, uh, and, uh, and a map of Antarctica, uh, seven by seven by seven. Uh, so uh, one thing that's going on here is like I, that I've always been fascinated with maps. And, and it's not just maps as uh, like a conduit of information, which I do appreciate, but uh, maps as objects. Uh, you know, the, the fact that a map when it's unfolded is this uh, flat thing. You know, it's like the page of a book. You know, we don't really consider a page of a book to be an object. We consider it to just be a, a flat conduit of information. But there was something always that about maps to me always. It was like a uh, prize at the bottom of a uh, box of cereal. Um, I remember seeing it and, you know, getting it. My, I had a subscription to National Geographic when I was a kid, and the map was the best part. When you, when you opened up the National Geographic and you got that nice, thick map, uh, it was like a prize. So I, even at, as, at a young age, I really kind of fetishized maps. Um, 
the, the map, whether or not it's folded uh, or it's crumpled or it's rolled, uh, it always remains a map, but its function changes. A uh, map can only really function uh, once it's unfolded. Um, so uh, calling attention to the object uh, uh, identity of a, of a map. Uh, there's a famous quote by uh, the philosopher Al Al Alfred Korzybski, and, uh, and the famous quote is, uh, the map is not the territory. Uh, and the whole point of that is to distinguish uh, between um, the real thing and, and the model uh, for the thing. We tend to, like, uh, you know, if I were to hold up a picture, of the, a map of the United States, and I'd ask you what it is, uh, most of you wouldn't say that's the map of the United States. You'd say that's the United States. So the, uh, if I hold up a picture of, uh, of a giraffe and I ask you what it is, you would say it's a giraffe. So the, so the point is, and particularly uh, as we become more, um, uh, more digital, is that we, we tend to think of um, uh, images as being the thing. Uh, you know, people take photographs with their phone and that becomes the, uh, uh, a way of seeing the world around them, but it, it's really just uh, information that's being filtered through your device. The only way to really experience something real is to inhabit the space that it's in. Um, so there's a bunch of ideas going on here, but one is calling attention to the fact that uh, this, you know, the, 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 the semantic um, identity of, uh, uh, you know, of, of a map being, um, n not being the thing, uh, but being a, um, um, being kind of an abstraction uh, or an abstract conduit of information about that thing. This is a map of Washington, D.C. from 2010. Uh, wood, uh, steel rods, and a map of Washington, D.C. Uh, 37, it's about 37 inches high. And it's just, um, there's a uh, kind of this fixture that's fixed into the ceiling and it just hangs off that like an elongated bird cage. Um, again, the, the, we know it's a map, but the map uh, can't function. Uh, still, it doesn't cease being a map. Okay. So I've done kind of a fair amount of work that deals with the idea of the globe. And um, this is a, kind of an earlier one called uh, Barns and Other Outbuildings. Um, and it's made of uh, a wood and a chipboard. And it's about 15 inch diameter. Um, so these are all really kind of basic or simplified uh, models of uh, essentially rural architecture. Um, and, it, uh, and it just cantilevers off the wall. It just kind of hangs there. Uh, the idea for this uh, sprung out of this field guide I got of uh, barns and other outbuildings of New England. Um, so I started to... Uh, try to recreate all the different types of, uh, of forms that I saw in that uh, field guide. Okay. This is uh, called An Astonishing New Collection of Oddities. <laughs> and uh, that's from 2010. Um, there's tiny little paper flags, all national flags, uh, and a, an appropriately sized uh, mouse hole cut into the wall. Uh, so that, when I say appropriately sized, it's about three, two and three quarter an inch high by two and a half inches wide. So I, uh, I mean, it's really kind of an absurd thing. Uh, there's, there's, some, there's some kind of screwed up narrative going on here that involves a mouse. And, uh, but like that earlier piece, the... Uh, uh, a map of England, it, this piece even more so than that, uh, was really meant to, to, to uh, be discovered uh, because it's uh, really just about the same size, but th it's being located in a place that normally you wouldn't uh, look to see something.
This is called, um, this is kind of an existential title, uh, 12 Ladders or How I Planned My Escape. And it's from uh, 2011. Uh, these are all little model wooden ladders that I made. And, and that's just a found image of the um, English countryside. Uh, so these are, these are models. I mean, I, I, I've had people see this image before and they thought uh, that it was uh, real size ladders. And I always see a look of disappointment in their face when I say that it's, it's just, these are really small. Uh, so it's 30 inches high by 22 inches by uh, nine inches deep. Um, like some of my early work, I just started making these ladders. I had no idea uh, what they were going to do. I just kind of enjoyed the, um, the, the straightforward precision that was involved in making these things. Um, and they kind of lived in my studio for a long time. And uh, one day I just decided to start leaning them up against a wall and it kind of revealed itself. I also realized when I leaned it up against a wall, uh, the collective weight of the ladders leaning against the wall uh, could pin this photograph to the wall. Uh, so this whole thing could go together without being fixed. So none of those uh, ladders are fixed together in that uh, that image is just being held uh, to the wall uh, by the ladders. Uh, so it's all gravity. Okay. N another, you know, I also work with, uh, you know, I don't really consider myself an installation artist, but I, but I have kind of made work that would be considered to be installation, uh, this being one. Um, this is uh, titled Mississippi uh, from 2011. Um, essentially what it is is a routed, uh, using a router and cutting the contour of the, the Mississippi River into the wall. Um, so it's, the vertical height is about 10 feet in this case. Uh, if you look at the image on the right, you can see the depth of the cut. Um, so um, th this is uh, one of those things where like, uh, when, once you find out what the title is, it kind of reveals what it is. Uh, if you don't know the title, it could just appear uh, first as a drawing, uh, then it could appear as a crack on the wall. So there's this kind of ambiguity with it. Uh, but this ended up leading to uh, this, uh, which is called Rio Grande. And uh, this is a few years later, 2012, and it's a, again, it's a, a line that's routed into a drywall. And this is a 20-foot high wall. Vertical height of this would be about 17 feet. Um, so the, the, kind of the cool thing about this, two, two things that I discovered uh, happened was uh, one, I could route out this line and then I could just keep uh, rolling paint on top of it and I could get that line to close a as much as I wanted it to, just the paint would start accumulating. Um, and, the, and the other thing is that uh, that black that comes out of that, uh, that, that uh, line in the wall because it actually has, uh, has depth to it is, um, it really registers, uh, and it, it does something r really quite odd. Uh, it kind of reverberates when you step away from it. You, you can, you know, it's tough to communicate in, uh, through a photo exactly what this does, but uh, you, can, you can sense the depth to it. Uh, it. It at once looks like it might be directly on the wall, but it also looks like it might be something hanging in the foreground. It's really kind of uh, tough to judge exactly what's going on, and, um, and that's because it, it's actually, the line is cut all the way through the drywall. Uh, this is called Better Homes for the Aged, uh, 2013. Uh, mixed media, uh, it's about five and a quarter inches uh, by 12 and a half inches by 12 inches. And I play a around a lot with architecture in my work. Um, so these are kind of uh, white clabbered siding, model siding, and uh, found um, kind of triangular blocks. Uh, and this is this just cantilevers off the wall. Uh, 
It's called The Hollow Moon Reveals Itself, uh, 2015. Uh, this is an acrylic globe that's uh, been painted and, uh, and, and uh, using a laser cutter. So it, it, certainly with this one, uh, talking about the hollow moon, which is kind of a uh, long-held uh, uh, kind of alternative idea of what the moon actually is. This is uh, called Shelter. It's from my 2016. Um, it's like a cut mylar and paper. Um, so it's this model pup tent, uh, but in this case the uh, the sides of the tent have, have these um, uh, stars that have been cut out. Uh, this is just set up in my studio with the uh, natural light filtering in through the window and you can kind of see how everything ends up projecting. Um, it's another piece I would uh, consider to be kind of in the same science fiction realm. This is called a 67P from 2016. Uh, I don't know if you remember 67P, but there was this um, uh, asteroid that I believe uh, the Japanese landed a uh, unmanned satellite onto, and it was uh, kind of really played up in the news for a while. But that uh, that shape in the center is the profile of the uh, the asteroid, and uh, and then there's these uh, plastic uh, parts. Um, one influence on my work. Um, it, uh, certainly is like 8-bit uh, video games. Uh, when I was a kid I had the, the Atari 2600 and I just, and it's, it's still to this day I love the uh, the level of abstraction, simplified color uh, that you get with that. Also uh, board games. Um, so in this case I certainly was kind of channeling that kind of 1980s uh, aesthetic. It's called a 1986 uh, 50 rafts. Uh, it's from 2017. It's mixed media. Um, so, you know, like with the latter piece, I started making these little model uh, rafts and uh, realized that they could uh, kind of uh, stack on top of each other. Um, so, they're in, and none of them are attached, they're all separate uh, pieces. Um, but uh, when they are stacked on top of each other, they create this kind of architectural framework. Uh, so this is just um, installed onto a, a shelf, a really shallow shelf that's on the wall. Uh, this piece is titled a Red Balloon. Uh, this is very recent, so I'm getting, I'm, uh, getting a bit uh, closer here. Um, it's about 12 inches across. Uh, this is just a, a, a world globe that I found that I... Uh, I ended up uh, cutting these circles into, uh, installed these grommets. And then at the center of that globe is a red, a red helium balloon, actually. Uh, and it just sets on the floor. Um, so uh, it, the whole point of the helium is it's just a, a kind of a nonsensical act. Um, you know, do, do obviously, like, there's no way to make this thing float. Um, but uh, I, I believe that the, uh, uh, the act of filling it with helium actually communicates something. Uh, so the, there's a str it's tied off and there's a string that comes down at the end of it. Okay, so I also work a lot with collage. This is um, an installation from a solo show I had at a, a gallery called Kansas in New York uh, back in 2011. Um, and I, I include this because it... Uh, kind of illustrates how, uh, you know, the, I've installed uh, this series uh, several times and, and often there's this kind of sequential way of installing it. Um, so uh, 
all the ones that I'm going to show now are uh, more or less over the past uh, three years. Um, uh, I think I've just eclipsed 290. I've been working on these since uh, 2008. And they always keep the same format. Uh, they're 10 inches high by 8 inches wide. Uh, it's a found image of uh, the wilderness or the pastor pastoral countryside. Uh, no sign of human beings whatsoever. Uh, and in the foreground, there's a construction. Often it's uh, some cannibalized uh, graphic device from uh, a book or from uh, packaging. This is uh, number 239 and 248. Uh, I'm showing these together not uh, because uh, they're a single piece, uh, but uh, part of the intent of these and part of the delight I get out of making them is not in just making the single one, but the fact that I'm trying to aim for like some kind of ultimate variation when I make these. I never make the same thing twice. I never use the same material twice. Uh, so in the process of doing that, I'm able to get, uh, I'm kind of able to kind of activate them and make them bounce off each other. 259 and 261. This is number 262 and number 266. Um, these uh, particularly, like, if you look at the one on the right, uh, it's collage, but because there's depth to the material, uh, they also have this kind of low relief quality to them. Uh, all the blemishes and, and, you know, the tears and everything, that's uh, just uh, either um, uh, the product of the original material or it's, it's because it just came out of the process of making it. Uh, so I, I allow for, uh, if I tape something down, it ends up tearing the paper, that's fine. Uh, so I, I kind of let the process play out when I make these. And uh, number 270 and 275. Uh, working with collage and, uh, and, and found material, uh, one thing that I do believe uh, working this way is that the material uh, carries its history with it. Uh, so I, I repurpose it. Uh, I cut it, I uh, reconfigure it, I make it into something else. But I, but I do think that uh, it's almost like a DNA, that uh, all this material uh, is coded uh, with its original purpose, uh, with its history. Uh, and, and for me, that kind of brings a certain uh, energy to the work. That's uh, 279 and 280. Two eighty-three and two eighty-seven. So again, the, you know, this is uh, some of the more recent ones. Okay, so this is a very recent piece. In fact, I just had a chance to document it not too long ago. Uh, this is called "No More Holidays," and it's uh, from it's just this past year, um, and it's uh, mixed media. Uh, about 16 inches high by 36 and a half inches wide by about one and a quarter inch deep. This is actually a, a wood frame, and this is set, oh, sorry, set into the wall um, when I allude to the one and a quarter inch uh, depth. Um, so these are all these uh, lined up plastic trays with collected uh, objects. And the, the only criteria for the collected objects is they have to be able to fit into these individual cells. Um, uh, on top of that, this is installed into a, a false wall, and there's a rear projection video coming through it. That's the in, results in this color and the illumination of the work. <coughs> Just to give you an idea. I've been playing around with the video, but uh, in this current form, it, oops. It exists as uh, as color bars. So, like with a lot of my work, there's an effort to to collect uh, stuff. That's a one thing that makes my work time consuming, 
is that uh, I, I need to find stuff. And, uh, and that takes longer than making things. Um, So if you look at this, you can, you can see a lot of the things going on. Some of the things are fragments, broken parts. Um, uh, plastic, metal, fabric, everything, paper. So this is a, a little side angle to give you an idea of the kind of the three-dimensional quality of it. You can see uh, Buddha popping his head out on the right. Okay, and this is the uh, last piece I'm going to show, um, but it's the piece I've been working on the longest. Actually, I think uh, when I was in McDowell Colony and you came by my studio, I had just more or less started this, so we're going back four years. Um, so this is called Charting the Known Universe from Memory. Um, it's a collage mixed media on paper. Um, it's about 16 and a half feet across. Uh, so it's really big. It's made up of uh, 5,415 individual inked cells. So um, there's a lot going on here. And here's uh, just some uh, details I've included. Uh, so those earlier collages I showed, uh, the, the world we live in where I'm making these uh, these collages on uh, these uh, landscape scenes. Uh, one thing that happens through that is I just f I go through so much material, and I found this uh, balance between working on those and working on this because it would allow me to uh, it, to take uh, uh, failed work, uh, stuff that didn't quite work out, and to kind of reconfigure it. Um, I go through a lot of material, and uh, like with all my work, I I don't use the same material twice, and uh, and this is one of the most difficult uh, things about it. It's just a rule I have is that I don't I don't use the same exact thing twice, um, because I know that if I follow that, it's it's going to result in this variety that I I don't. I, I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to make it. It's just going to happen out of the, as a product of uh, following that rule. So each one of these is just a separate little composition. The the spaces that are uh, apparently blank uh, are inhabited by uh, paper, white paper. So all the all the spaces have been filled in. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, white paper, and you know, people who are really into books uh, uh, know this, is that uh, you know we we tend to think paper is paper, uh, but paper is comes in, just simple white paper comes in so many so many different colors, uh, and it ages differently. So you you can get paper that used to be white that's now brown or yellow, all burnt out. Uh, so, you know, it might have a blue or a yellow or a, a pink cast to it. Um, so I'm also collecting all this different type of white paper. Just to give you an idea of scale, it's it's my ugly mug standing in front of it. Um, yeah, so it's about 16 and a half feet across. Um, but that's uh, that's where I'm going to leave off this uh, this slideshow with my most recent work. And I think we're doing pretty good for time. I think I ended up coming in about 40 40 minutes. But I'm happy to uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to field those. Yes. Yeah. So is that a conscious choice that you make not to kind of use books in a gallery or installation? Yeah, I'm kind of old school when it comes to this stuff. Like I still uh, can hear the hum of the projector when I do this. So uh, I still treat this like I would a traditional slideshow. 
uh, in that I, I, I'm not interested so much in a multimedia presentation as I am just showing images and, and talking briefly about the images. Um, yeah, so uh, it's just a personal choice. It's completely up to the viewer. I mean, in fact, I just to add to that, uh, s you know, something I think about with my work is uh, I've learned more, a tremendous amount of my work through other people looking at it, uh, and it's and I find that probably to be the most one of the most rewarding things about showing work is people will tell you what they see and they'll tell you stuff that went over your own head. Because, you know, you, you can't see the forest through the trees often when you make something. Uh, and then it takes somebody else to look at it and say, uh, oh, it was interesting how you did that. And, and then you're like, wow, it's like I, I hadn't even thought about it that way, but it was ha hanging out there all along. Um, so I would say, with my work in general, like I, I I try to make it open to interpretation. I just want to have enough there so that people want to look at it. And then whatever they end up taking away from it um, is great. I don't, I don't have a direct message. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how you're like collecting all this stuff. And I, I came in late, so maybe you already mentioned this. But um, are you collecting things like because you like collecting things or because it comes from like a sustainability perspective and you're just trying to collect recycling and stuff like that? I'm an environmental studies minor, so I'm always kind of interested in that. It's or, just an obsessive pursuit. Cool. <laughs> and <laughs> and it goes sense. goes all the way back to my childhood. And like, I, it's funny because, you know, it, oftentimes with other artists, you, you might have a conversation about uh, how you started making art, like your earliest influences and... You know, you can talk about, you know, those rainy Sundays uh, having nothing to do but to draw and all that stuff. But I, I had collections, you know, I cl and I w obsessively um, uh, organized and reorganized these things. Um, so so I, had, I still have all these collections, but I, it's something that I've done ever since I was a kid, and, uh, and it's something that still is, is kind of ingrained in me to... Uh, to um, uh, what's it? It's uh, the term, I guess, is taxonomy. It's ta it's taking a variety or, or an ultimate variety of things and trying to find all these variations. Um, and I, I enjoy doing that through my uh, uh, through my work. So, but but there is some delight I, I do get out of uh, reusing material that would otherwise be uh, thrown away. Uh, thanks for a really engaging yeah. talk. Um, in the last, those two questions, they made me think of questions I have about the work that's on view here, Horizon, that, um, and I should have mentioned in my, when I was um, introducing you that that work had been acquired by the Palmer Museum yeah. of Art, the museum that organized the show, and they placed it in their speculative futures section of the exhibition, and then hearing you talk about uh, science fiction interests and how mm. people can kind of take what they want from their interpretation of the work. I'm just curious if you sort of have a, what your take on the work being presented in that context of a show that includes a lot of work by artists who are activists or who might be responding to sort of global plastic crisis from all sort of different perspectives, um, if that's something that is making you think about that work differently or it being presented in that context. I, what it, that it doesn't make you? me f uh, think it, it, to, to be honest with you, it's, it kind of exists on its own now. Like, I don't, I don't even talk to it anymore. Uh, it, it just does its own thing. And, uh, and again, make, you know, making something like that, that it's, there's very kind of clean, uh, followed rules and parameters uh, in making it. It's just a horizon uh, located directly through the center of this form. Uh, and, uh, and an ultimate variety of these. So it, it's, <coughs> and then after that, uh, it is whatever anybody thinks it is. For me, when I was originally making it, it was just this, uh, you know, it was kind of a romantic piece. You know, it was, it was about that uh, endless uh, horizon and the, and the fact that each one of these is different, but essentially it's a photograph of the same exact thing. At a different location, but it's just a line cutting across the uh, the horizon. So, you know, there, my intent in the, in the beginning, obviously, 
you know, obviously, uh, it's the piece is open to interpretation. How I feel about it now, I I, I don't know. To to be honest with you, I, it's the first time I've seen it, and uh, <laughs> since then, so I got to think about that a little bit. It's so great to hear you talk about your work and um, knowing you for years and kind of following you and. Um, as you were first talking about that piece at the new museum, um, I started to think about, um, I think around the time that I was showing, I was going to New York while I was in grad school and we had talked about it being in, a, in the old location. And I started to think about seeing a Tom Friedman show there that yeah. had his pickup sticks piece where he like made a mirror image of pickup sticks. And there was also a piece there where he, had these um, construction paper cutouts of some uh, of what a body would look like if it fell off of like a hundred-story building, and um, and then I started to think about Mike Smith, who we talked about yeah. that we were in school with at the Art Institute, and I realized that um, you remind me of them physically as a human, like you, the three of you kind of look similar, you hold yourself <laughs> similar, and um, I realized that there's a also this kind of thing between all of you, you know, like Mike Smith um, would make action figures of people named John or all of the hot dog carts within a 10 mile radius of his home in Brooklyn. And, and um, Tom Friedman would have rules um, for his hot balls piece where he was just like stealing balls from stores and increasing the scale every time. Um, and it made me think a lot about um, these artists who are these three artists that are very fastidious and have attention to detail and things are generally very kind of labor intensive and small and it made me, um, by the time we got to that latter piece, um, it, it's very small and I was beginning to think a lot about scale and alternative ways to think about scale. Um, I think so often we think about scale as large things. Mm -hmm. And I think there's ways that your smaller pieces hold space um, as small pieces that larger pieces would. And I started to think about like scale in relationship to labor and time and systems and collections. And you know, around the time that we met, you had talked about like this archive of magazines that you were using that you had for a long time, and you've been using them for ten years. And I think I showed them to you. I, th I think yeah. I had a, at least a couple boxes. Yeah, you were packing yeah. up. We were both kind of leaving at the same time. And yeah. so I guess that all of that is to say I'm interested in what you have to say about scale and um, ways that you think about scale other than things that are just straight big. Well, you, you have architectural scale. Uh, it, it takes a certain, um, um, what, would, what would the term be? A, uh, um, suspension of disbelief is the term. Uh, when you project yourself into, uh, into a small space. Mm -hmm. Like you have to believe in it. And, and as children, we do. You know, a child can sit down and play with uh, matchbox cars, kind of believe he's inside one of those cars, play with Lego the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like you, there's little interior spaces here inside them. Um, um, so for, for me, that's my formative experience with, with that scale. Uh, you know, some, one of my, you mentioned, you know, I've always liked Tom Friedman's work, but uh, um, Joseph Cornell is always, I've always had a soft spot for Joseph Cornell. And in, in particular, because I love to, he works in miniature, but also you can project yourself into his work. It's these spaces that you can imagine yourself being in. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I've always uh, been able to do that. And uh, I, I suppose you know most people are. And that might be changing with digital technology, and that you're, that maybe uh, the screen um, cha maybe changes the way that you uh, you experience uh, space like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's just a formative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but just one last thing is when I was installing that piece at the new museum, it was right after the Tom Friedman show, uh. and and the security guard. Uh, Talk to me like he knew me. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And, and, he, and he thought I was Tom Friedman. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anybody else?
I guess it's about color. <laughs> Maybe you talked about this, but in the horizon line, is that nostalgia influencing the tones that you're selecting? Um, because it's so different from these, you know, bright primary colors that I see in other works. And I'm wondering if, like, your group of um, magazines, like, is it from a certain period, or is the color referencing, like, a particular <coughs> decade or period? Or I, For me, I'm open to all printed material. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, printed material doesn't exist like it used to. really doesn't. Uh, everything, it's, it's surprising when you think about it, it's more or less everything that we uh, consume is uh, on a screen now. You can still buy books, but they don't exist like they used to. Uh, uh, so analog photography uh, was uh, pretty, it was predominant, I'd say, all the way through the mid-late 90s. Um, the best analog photography, like the place I like to go, uh, is probably the 70s and 80s. And it's not so much for nostalgia, but it's just so funky uh, because of colors. Uh, it, you know, I, I think now, like, in a way, we aim at uh, objective uh, portrayal uh, through photography. You know, you can make a perfect photo uh, and you can have it be incredibly accurate. Of course, on your phone, you're able to kind of uh, put a filter on it and stuff like that. People like to play around with that. But that early analog photography, I shouldn't say early, it was just a couple decades ago, um, it just it was so open to the interpretation of the photographer in terms of like pushing that yellow. Uh, or, you know, like a lot of the um, landscapes that I'm attracted to in my collages have. Uh, this kind of unworldly color to them, uh, which is directly through the product of the, uh, or directly through the process of, of that photographer. Um, and, you know, like a, a sky that's way, way, way too purple, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, way too uh, thick and yellow. Um, so, you know, oftentimes they would, they would uh, exaggerate uh, some color that's already there that that we really don't do in photography uh, anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I personally have nostalgia. I I don't I don't try to insert that into the work. It's it it comes out of the uh, the product of uh, uh, working with analog photography. Um, so yeah. Um, you said earlier um, that it's up to the gallery curators to install your work and choose the color order um, and some of the organization in in the work. Yeah. So maybe you can talk about the li maybe like the human need for organization and your use of the grid sure. in that organization, but also this false sense of randomness that humans tend to have, because we have all these blues and yellows perfectly spaced out, but then we also put a couple right next to each other, because that's what a random thing would look like. We try to make things look random. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we can do anything but that. It's kind of like, uh, generate some random numbers. <laughs> you're going you're to be like, oh, seven. Uh, <laughs> And you're just going to come up with numbers. You're going to make sure that you don't repeat the same number. But that could happen randomly, right? Um, the, uh, that New City piece, the, uh, early, one of the earliest pieces I showed, uh, there were just a handful of rules in order to set it up. One is everything's on a uh, north, south, east, west axis. So everything's on an axis, all right angles. Uh, no uh, piece. Uh, completely hides the piece underneath it. Uh, so the piece on top has to be smaller than the one below it. Uh, and an effort has to be made to cover the entire surface so the bottom pieces have to uh, fit together. Uh, so I think those are the three basic rules. And then beyond that, however, the, you know, however it's installed, it's uh, outside my control. Um, 
but uh, you know, uh, w with having the work installed and I'm not there, uh, like with the horizon piece, uh, it's strike a line across the wall, and uh, and, you, and there's uh, some adhesive that's used on it. And then after that, it's just up to whoever's uh, setting up the work to kind of decide the order that it goes in. Um, yeah. And I, and I think it, there's absolutely no getting past the fact that people are going to make aesthetic decisions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with you. I don't think that that randomness is, is, is possible. I think we're constantly uh, kind of processing and making decisions in terms of what we're doing. Well, uh, maybe returning to earlier when we talked about your work in speculative fiction yeah. exhibitions and your the use of language in terms of digitalness and computers, <laughs> early on in the presentation you talked about sort of the idea of the map representing the globe or the image becoming more important than the thing the image is of. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you were thinking about sort of like maybe theories of late capitalism or sort of Jean Baudrillard's uh, idea of the simulacra, mm -hmm. sort of like the thing becoming less important than the image of the thing? Yeah, I think we're there right now. I do. Um, you know, I, th I think we're, we're uh, you know, like I'm a big fan of YouTube. I spend a lot of time on YouTube. And I think it's very easy to uh, travel the world in on YouTube. Uh, to do all these things and experience all these things that uh, that that you yourself would like to do, uh, but somehow there's no need to do it because it's already there for you. Um, yeah, uh, that's it's one idea. The you know another idea is if you know I alluded to earlier the fact that we filter our experience through our uh, devices. Um, I think we're at a point right now that you weren't there if you don't have an image of it. And the image isn't merely proof that you were there. Uh, it, it, was, it was the way in which you experienced it. Um, it used to be that a photo was a memento of, of a moment or, or an occasion. I, I think the photo now is, is a necessity. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not passing judgment on that at all, but I, that's what, I, uh, what I've seen happen. Um, so I, I, that's all I'm really able to touch upon with that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>